there's been plenty of times she hasn't made my day out there either. So, uh, have you ever been maybe like watching TV and you're kind of drowsy? Does that happen to any of you? I call our living room the sleeping room and our bedroom the bedroom. They're very different. I sleep. I go to sleep easier and more quickly in the sleeping room, which is the living room. But uh, every once in a while, we'll be watching something, and I'll just be a little bit drowsy. And then I hear them, beep, 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 you know, when they do the weather things or the tests. And so I want to tell you this morning, we're studying on uh, the Holy Spirit. And the lesson that uh, it's a beep, beep, beep morning that uh, <clears throat> will get our attention to some of the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And it is in the second chapter of 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1. Paul is writing to the uh, church at Corinth. And he said, Dear brothers and sisters, when I first came to you, I didn't use lofty words and brilliant ideas to tell you God's message. For I decided to concentrate only on Jesus Christ and his death on the cross. I came to you in weakness, timid and trembling, and my message and my preaching were very plain. I did not use wise and persuasive speeches, but the Holy Spirit was powerful among you. I did this so that you might trust the power of God rather than human wisdom. Now, was, was Paul uh, capable of giving per, uh, wise words and uh, persuasive speeches? Absolutely. In fact, we read about some of them in Scripture. Paul was a very uh, educated, in fact, probably had the highest education of the time. Uh, he sat at the feet of Gamaliel, which was known as one, uh, as, as one of the best teachers, if not the best teacher of the day. Paul was a very educated, well-spoken man. But he said, when I came to you, I, I didn't use any of that. And we can find that that's true if you'll turn over just a few pages to uh, 2 Corinthians 10 10 in 2nd Corinthians 10 10 listen to what uh, some of the Corinthians had said about Paul it said for some say and he's speaking to the Corinthians here as well in his second letter to them don't worry about Paul his letters are demanding and forceful but in person he is weak his speeches are really bad so, but he said, and that's in the second letter, but in the first letter, he said, when I came to you, I came to you with the intent of preaching Jesus and him crucified and the cross, the gospel. Folks, the word gospel means good news. And that good news is that Jesus Christ died on the cross in our place. He took the punishment, not only took the punishment, which he did for our sins. Scripture tells us he became our sin on that cross. And he, he died so that we could spend an eternity in heaven. Because you see, our sin separated us from God. So we had no hope. And we had to have a perfect sacrifice, which was Jesus Christ. And because of him, you and I, accept him as our savior and the blood of jesus christ takes away our sin and he makes us a new creature you know when when before I, i've told you this before but before i got saved i i of course i was only 12 but but i did pretty much what i wanted to and after i got saved i still did pretty much what i wanted to but folks my want to said changed drastically now, when you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, your want-tos changed, and you became a new person. If a person says, I've accepted Jesus Christ, and it produces no change whatsoever in their life, 
no change of attitude and and uh, that when you accept Jesus he makes you a new creature you're not the person you used to be you're a brand new person that that he makes us so when a person accepts Christ there's evidence of it in your life and and you can think back when you accepted Jesus as your Savior how your attitudes changed and how the things you wanted to do changed maybe you had a didn't weren't too crazy about being in church before but after you accepted Jesus uh, you want to be here I hope that being here this morning is not just a habit for you because Christians can fall into a habit of going to to church on Sunday because that's what you've always done but we don't want to ever let it become a habit we before we get here get excited about it because it's a gathering of God's people to worship the Lord together and it's an opportunity for you and I to come together and celebrate the resurrection of our Savior so he said uh, when I first came to you I didn't use lofty words or brilliant ideas to tell you God's message but to going back uh, for a little look at these verses he said I decided he made a decision to concentrate only on Jesus Christ and his death on the cross so Paul said I made up my mind I wasn't going to get sidetracked I made up my mind Paul said that I was going to stay focused and that I was going to uh, give the message of Jesus Christ and his death on the cross you know folks the cross um, is a proclaimer of the gospel it's not a defender of the gospel he said I came to you in weakness timid and trembling and those of you that have read and studied your Bible very much uh, this is not to be taken with the fact that Paul was just literally scared and and shaking but he came not in his own power or to show what he knew or to show how he could speak he said I came to proclaim Jesus Christ uh, and the cross And my message and my preaching were very plain. Well, they seem to have thought so. In fact, they thought it was so plain it was bad. And we'll find out later in this lesson why they thought that. Why Paul was defending and proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ, and they thought he was just boring and bad. Well, let me give you a spoiler alert. You know why, don't you? Because spiritual things, we'll read a little later, can't be discerned by carnal hearts, worldly hearts. If a person does, isn't saved and if they don't have the Holy Spirit, then we don't understand spiritual things. So why did they think he was boring? They didn't understand spiritual things because they didn't have the Holy Spirit guiding them at that time. Uh, through Walk through the Bible. I'll just, I'll just tell you this about the church in Corinth. Uh, in the program walk through the Bible they call the books of Corinthians spanking the Saints so that gives that tells you enough about the Corinthian church they certainly did have have their problems but he said I did not use wide and, and uh, persuasive speeches but he said the Holy Spirit was powerful among you be 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 the Holy Spirit, he said, was powerful among you. And can I say something to you this morning? The Holy Spirit is powerful among you. The Holy Spirit is powerful among us. I did this so that you might trust the power of God rather than human wisdom. He said, I did it. I came to you the way I came to you, humbly, not exalting himself in any way, but exalting the Lord Jesus and him crucified. And he said, I did it so that you would trust the power of God rather than human wisdom. And folks, let me make a suggestion to all of us today that we learn to trust the power of God and not human wisdom. There is a lot 
of human wisdom out there today that is not godly wisdom. And we need to learn to trust in the power of God rather than to trust in human wisdom. And there, like I said, there's all kinds of human wisdom out there. But I want to tell you, if it does not agree with the word of God, it's only human wisdom, which is really no wisdom at all. Verse number six, yet when I am among mature Christians, I do speak with words of wisdom, but not the kind of wisdom that belongs to this world and not the kind that appeals to the rulers of this world who are being brought to nothing. He said, when I'm with mature Christians, and folks, when we first get saved, we are baby Christians, and we're fed on the milk of the word. The milk of the word is, is the gospel. We understood that. We accepted Jesus as our Savior. But then as we are Christians for a longer amount of time, folks, we should be growing. And let me tell you how we can be sure that we do grow. Spend time in this book, and you could not grow if you wanted. You couldn't stop yourself from growing if you tried. Because this is the milk and the meat of the Word. And when you study this book, you grow in your Christian life. So he said, when I'm among mature Christians, Christians who have been Christians for a while, and you know what? When somebody first gets saved, we need to remember that they are baby Christians and don't expect them to start doing everything just right overnight. Well, they got saved and they still da 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 da. No, give them time to grow. You had to have time to grow. I had to have time to grow. And we need to nurture them, come alongside of them, and encourage them. And, uh, and give them time to mature. And if they're spending time in God's word, they will mature. And so he said, when I uh, speak among mature Christians, he said, I speak with words of wisdom, but not the worldly wisdom that belongs to the world, not the kind that appeals to the rulers of this world who are being brought to nothing. Verse number seven, no, the wisdom we speak of is the secret wisdom of God, which was hidden in former times, though he made it for our benefit before the world began. Beep, beep, beep. We need to pay attention to what that verse just said. He said, no, the wisdom we speak of is the secret wisdom of God, which was hidden in former times, though he made it for our benefit before the world began. What's he talking about? He's talking about the cross. It was hidden in former times. When Jesus even talked to the disciples about it, did they understand it before the crucifixion and before his resurrection, before the the Holy Spirit came, did they understand what Jesus was saying? No, all they understood was he was going away and they didn't like it. But they didn't understand. Why? Because it was hidden from them. It was hidden in former times, though he made it for our benefit, when? Before the world began. It's awesome, isn't it? Before the world began, Jesus Christ knew he was going to die on the cross. Before the world began, God knew the plan. He knew what was going to happen. Um, Ephesians 1, 4, 3 or 4, tells us that before the world began, the, book, the names were written in the book of life. And, you know, I say that to people sometimes, and they say, oh, no, when you get saved, your name is written in the book of life. Well, it says in um, Ephesians and also in Revelation that that name was written in there before the foundation of the world. Do you know what that means to us? God knew you. God knew you. 
before the foundation of the world, God knew you. And I know people have a hard time uh, accepting that, and, and I have a kind of a hard time wrapping my mind around it. But folks, wouldn't it be a little bit foolish for us to believe that we have an all-knowing God that knows everything, knows the beginning and the end, and everything in the middle, he knows what's going to happen to you tomorrow. You don't, but does he? Does, does God know what's going to happen to you tomorrow? Is God going to be surprised by anything that happens to any of us tomorrow? No, because God has a foreknowledge that he knows everything before it happens. So wouldn't it be just a little bit foolish of us to think that God knew everything except he was going to get saved? It doesn't mean that certain ones, just the ones in the book, can be saved and nobody else can. If that were true, we'd have to take all the whosoever will verses and tear them out of the Bible because they would not be true. Whosoever will, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That is true. But what that tells us is that God knew you so well, and he knew me so well, that he knew that we would accept. So that doesn't take away our need to give out the gospel. It makes it even stronger because there's people out there that that we can share uh, the gospel with. Verse 8 says, But the rulers of this world have not understood it. And they didn't, did they? But look at what it says. If they had, they would never have crucified our glorious Lord. Why did God keep that a secret? And you say, well, he didn't really keep it a secret because Isaiah told it, Ezekiel told it, the minor prophets told it, Daniel told it. So he didn't actually keep it a secret, but he, it was a mystery. They had the word, they just didn't know what it meant. And if they had known then they wouldn't have crucified the Lord. If, they, if everybody there that day, if all the Romans had known or the Jews had known, hey, this, he is really the Messiah. He's God, he really, if they all knew this is God's son, would they have crucified him? They crucified him because they didn't believe he was God's son. They didn't believe he was who he said he was. Had they known and understood, they would not have crucified him if they had not have crucified him. There would be no forgiveness of our sins. There would be no future, our positive future that God has for us in heaven. Is that an example of their eyes being blinded? Yes, it's exactly what it is, Doug. But the rulers of this world uh, have not understood it. If they had, they would never have crucified our glorious Lord. This is what the scriptures mean when they say, And this, uh, I could go back to Isaiah 64, 4 and read this, but I'm just going to read it from right here. It's a very familiar verse to you. <clears throat> no eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. Those of you that memorized it uh, may have, like me, out of the King James, eye has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man what God has prepared for those that love him. We're all familiar with that, aren't we? Okay, oh, a year or so ago, maybe a little over maybe, we uh, studied in here for over a year about heaven, didn't we? And it wasn't because of this verse. It was because of the next one. And most of the time, we don't connect the next verse to this verse. And we really err when we don't because it said, okay, let's read that verse again. Um, 
He's saying it cannot be understood by human means, and that is true. It cannot be understood by human means. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. But, verse 10 says, we know these things. How and why? Because God has revealed them to us. How? By his spirit. And his spirit searches out everything and shows us even God's deep secrets. Do you know how you understood the gospel when you received Christ as your Savior? The Holy Spirit revealed it to you. And if he hadn't revealed it to you, you couldn't have been saved at that time. Nobody saved except the Holy Spirit draw them and when the Holy Spirit draws us he's making us conscious of our sin convicted of our sin and he draws us that way but it says eye hasn't seen ear hasn't heard mind hasn't imagined and that is all absolutely the truth by human means we cannot understand any of this but we know these things that's why we spent over a year studying about heaven in here was because it said but we do know these things because god has revealed them to us by the holy spirit what is the work of the holy spirit revealing to us what god has prepared for those who love him and his spirit searches out everything pretty conclusive pretty inclusive isn't it his spirit searches out everything and shows us even god's deep secrets the things that were secret before are not secret anymore verse number 11 no one can know what anyone else is really thinking except that person alone and no one can know god's thoughts except god's own spirit If somebody walks up to you today and says, wow, you really look nice today. Do you know what they're thinking? Probably not. Your mother dressed you? Could be. You know, we don't always know, or we don't ever know actually, what the other person is thinking. I, I think of this when we sit in the congregation in our worship service. Nobody knows what each one in there is thinking. You know, where the Holy Spirit is taking them and, uh, and, or the journey that they're on or what they're hearing. It says, no, no one can know what anyone else is really thinking except that person alone. Okay, you know what you're thinking, but I don't know what you're thinking. I know what I'm thinking, but you don't know what I'm thinking. And no one, and what does no one mean? No one. And no one can know God's thoughts except God's own spirit. Now, if the Holy Spirit knows the very thoughts of God, then the Holy Spirit has to be God. If he wasn't God, he wouldn't know what God was thinking. But because he knows what God is thinking, then he has to be God. And he is. Verse number 12. And God has actually given us his spirit, not the world's spirit. Okay, why has God given us the Holy Spirit? I wrote why after that. So we can know the wonderful things God has freely given us so that we can know the wonderful things that God has freely given us how do we know the wonderful things that God has freely given us the Holy Spirit teaches us verse number 13 when we tell you this we do not use words of human wisdom we speak words given to us by the Spirit, 
using the Spirit's words to explain spiritual truths. Can I tell you something? How many of you would like to know the best commentary on this book? The, I, I'm going to tell you the very best commentary you can possibly have on this book. It is the best. By far the best. This book is the best commentary on this book. <laughs> and that's what that verse is telling us. We speak words given to us by the Spirit using the Spirit's words to explain spiritual truths. You want to know what these verses mean? Read the rest of the Bible. Because the Bible is the absolute best commentary. You know what? When I read a commentary written by somebody, and there's some of them that I really respect a lot and love them, but if, if they say something I disagree with, I don't mind saying, you know, I don't, I don't agree with that. I have a freedom to do that, and you do too. They're men writing a commentary. We don't have to agree with everything they say. But oh, if it says it in this book. And uh, you know what's really exciting to me in Bible study is to find two verses that look like they contradict each other. And they're in there, aren't they? There are verses in there, and you read that one, and you read that one, and it looks like a direct contradiction. Let me tell you something. All Scripture agrees. There are no contradictions. So if I have two <laughs> verses, and they look like they contradict each other, one of my, the interpretation, my interpretation of one of those verses is wrong. So I have to go to the Bible, and you do too, to find out which one is wrong. Which one agrees with all scripture? How does it, what has to take place here to make all scripture agree? Because there are no contradictions in this book. And if it ever appears that there is, it's giving you a good study point. Because if it looks like they contradict each other, your interpretation of one of those verses is wrong. And this is the best book to find out what it is. Verse number 14. But people who aren't Christians can't understand these truths from God's Spirit. It all sounds foolish to them because only those who have the Spirit can understand what the Spirit means. Folks, listen, if somebody's not saved, don't expect them to understand spiritual things. Scripture's very plain that they won't. But you know what I think? I think if every Christian acted like a Christian, if every Christian talked like a Christian, if every Christian went to the places Christians go and don't go to the places that Christians don't go. If every Christian walked like a Christian every day, I believe the world would come to Christ. But folks, right now, when you get out there, you almost have to have a scorecard to tell the Christians from the, to tell the unbelievers from the believers. We've blended so much that why would they want to be like us when we're almost like them? They can't understand spiritual things yet, but you know what they do understand? They do understand a Christian being a Christian. And let me tell you something. If you, if you claim to be a Christian and you don't live like one, I have talked to plenty of the people, people in the world who have said, I was disappointed. I thought they were a Christian. And yet, they didn't portray that. So we disappoint the world when we don't live up to who and what we say we are. I believe Christians need to live like so that the world may see your good deeds and your Father will be glorified. Don't be a Christian that wants to walk as close to the world as you can. You see, here's the problem. If we say, okay, I'm going to keep a certain distance. I'm going to 
distance myself a certain distance from the world. You know, I, I may not do everything just right, but boy, I'm sure not as bad as they are. Well, as the world grows farther away from Christ, what happens to you? You grow farther away from Christ as well. Oh, you still got your distance from the world. You're still not like the unbelievers. You've still got your feel-good package. But as the world goes farther away from the Lord, so do you. The world is not the standard. Jesus Christ is. But that sounds foolish to a person who doesn't have the Holy Spirit. They don't understand that. Why? Because it's the Holy Spirit that gives us the understanding. We who have the Spirit understand these things, but others can't understand us at all. Did you see that? They just don't not understand people who aren't saved. And, and if you are a Christian and you live like a Christian, they not only won't understand the things of the Bible, they won't understand you. They may think you're about a half a bubble off plum because of how you believe. And folks, we shouldn't become discouraged by that because they don't, and it's not that, I don't even think it's that they're being mean or vicious some of the time. I'll even go out as far as saying most of the time. It's just that they don't understand. Yes. And then, then he says, uh, but others don't un understand us at all, so don't be surprised, don't be dismayed, and don't get angry. What that says, and it ought to make you real happy, is that you've done something that they believe you're a Christian. How could they? And look what it says. Who can know what the Lord is thinking? And who can give him counsel? It's a rhetorical question. The answer is obviously no one. Folks, let me tell you something. If there was one iota of information that anyone could give to God, then he's not who he says he is. If there is one thing that God needs you to do, there's many things he wants us to do, but if there was one thing that God had a need for you to do or for me to do, then he's not who he says he is. Because he doesn't need me. He has no needs. Our God has no needs and he has all knowledge. So if there is one thing that any of us or anybody could do that would make God better, then he's sure who he says he is. But my friends, we know he is who he says he is. He's all powerful. He has all knowledge. He's omnipresent. Everything he says about himself is true. And we need him. My friend, he doesn't need us. And don't you think that makes it sweeter that he just wants us? I do. But we can understand these things, for we have the mind of Christ. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, the scripture tells us. So if we have, let me give you an equation. If we have the word of God plus the spirit of God, that will equal the mind of Christ. As you study this book, you will have the mind of Christ. The scripture plus the Holy Spirit teaching you equals the mind of Christ. And if we have the mind of Christ, and scripture says we do, don't you think we should be obedient to it? You know what? Most of the time when we're tempted to sin, we know what the right thing to do is. We just choose some to do the wrong thing. It's by choice. You've had times in your life when you haven't known what to do. I have too. But in sinful issues, when we're tempted to sin, 
we know. We have a power within us to not do that. Boy, I sure wish I'd listened to it. Don't you? But I just continue to make bad decisions. I continue to sin. Uh, I, in my heart, I want to do what's right. I just don't do it in my flesh. But oh, my friend, you know what? That's why I need a Savior. Because I do say wrong things. I do wrong things. I think wrong things. And every time I do, it makes me know, Brenda, that's why you need a Savior every single day. Because you and I, we just don't live above sin. Well, I think we get better as we have the mind of Christ about some sins, but living a sinless life, we're just not going to do it in this life. And you know what? That's one of the things that God has prepared for those that love him, is a place where we'll live and always do, think, and say the right things. We'll always have a heart of love. We'll love everybody, and everybody will love us. No, no jealousy, no bickering. Just a want, Heaven's going to be a wonderful place of, finally, a place of unity with our Savior. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for the Holy Spirit that teaches us and uh, convicts us, Father, and we just pray, Lord, that you would help us to listen to the Holy Spirit, to read your word. And Father, as we read your word, I pray that each one of us, that the Holy Spirit would show us each time that we read your word, what you would have us to learn that day, what you would have us to learn from that scripture. So, Father, we're thankful for the Holy Spirit that guides us in your word and teaches us your word so that we might have a mind like yours. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.